Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast with your host, Bruce Hutchin, episode number 167. Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, where it is all about whitetail deer hunting tips, techniques, and the stories so you can become a more successful whitetail deer hunter. And now your host, Bruce Hutchin. Jim Willen joins us today, and he is the current president of Pope and Young. Here's a quote from Jim. We want to encourage the original spirit of bow hunting, that by limiting yourself to a bow and arrow, you have to get close to the animal, make better and more effective shots, and grow as a hunter. Jim's been hunting since the age of 17 and has taken at least one big animal with a bow every year for 36 years. He never buys meat and with exception of bacon now and then. His family only cooks what I kill and catch. He is proud to serve as president of Pope and Young Club, but even more proud to serve the hunting community in a way that might improve the future of hunting and bow hunting in particular. Welcome to another episode of White Tail Rendezvous Podcast. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin. And we're heading out to Pope and Young land. Yes, Chatfield, Minnesota is the home office of Pope and Young. And t- this afternoon, we're going to talk to the president who was recently reelected for his second term, Mr. Jim Willems. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bruce. I'm glad to be here. Well, how did you end up at Pope and Young? A lot of our listeners are going to be interested in that. There's been a lot of uh, copy and meter um, and press releases out there, but let's share with the um, listeners how you came to be president of Pope and Young Club. Okay, well, it, it all started in 1987. Um, I'd been bow hunting for what, about eight, eight, nine years, something like that, and I'd actually taken a couple of Pope and Young animals and entered them in the book, and the uh, Pope and Young Convention was going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1987, and I lived in Central Kansas. So that was a reasonably close uh, event. So uh, my brother and I hunt together all the time, and and he had joined a few months earlier, and and I figured out that I could kind of afford to go and get some time off. And I joined the club and went to the the convention uh, where they have the awards program every other year. And uh, just the fact that you meet so many um, hardcore, uh, famous bow hunters at these events, and, and, you know, they bring in everybody and treat them just like any other bow hunter and I was so impressed with the organization I joined and and we have kind of a unique membership structure you you have to be a member for a while before you can become a voting member and my goal was to stay with the club long enough to become a voting member through that period I got certified to be an official major and uh, eventually became a voting member and and then served on some committees and was considering running for a, a director position and a few people talked me into running for president, not really thinking about whether I could win or not. And lo and behold, I ran a, a hard campaign and, and won the position. And now I'm on my second term. So, so that's kind of the brief history of me and Pope and Young Club. Well, thank you for your service. And uh, in our warm up, we, we did talk about service and that's uh, passing yours. Um, and let's sit here and, and, and chit chat about that for a little bit. What does that mean to you? And how can members of Pope and Young Club and hunters, men and women throughout North America, get more involved? Yeah. And, and I'm going to talk more about just the average hunter because cause a good percentage of the serious Pope and Young Club members, uh, they, they belong because they want to help the sport. And they're already active in their state organizations, and and they do a lot of a lot of work service wise. But what we really need to get across to people, uh, bow hunters especially, because we're such a solitary sort. If we don't get our butt get off of our butts and and get active and do something to help the sport, to to help the wildlife, to help habitat, to to help the impression that other people see, uh, you know, eventually we're going to be outnumbered and we're going to lose what we've, you know, worked so hard to get. And and it doesn't take a lot of work. It, it could be just as small as writing a letter to your congressman. That that has to be the bare minimum that people are willing to do. But beyond that, there are so many things you can do to ensure the future of your sport, uh, whether it's, it's going to game department meetings and speaking out for or against things, uh, going to legislatures, speaking out for or against things. And I understand not everybody's cut out for that, but if, if you were to get more active in, say, the state organizations and help out on some of the small ways, that frees up time for 
for some of the hardcore workers to, to go do some of the harder things. And I, I think we all owe it to our sport, for the future of our sport, to get up and do something. Thank you for sharing that. And when you look in any town, uh, listeners, there's somebody there. It might not be the uh, Popion Club um, where you can get together, but there are conservation groups that your voice makes a difference. Your activity, your investment in an hour a month makes a difference. So think about that. You agree to that, Jim? Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to get at. Just just a little bit of, of help is okay, somewhere around 3 million bow hunters in the United States. And, and nobody really knows for sure. There could be, that, that number could be 2 million, it could be 3.5 million. But let's just say there's 3 million bow hunters based on licensed sales. It's hard to tell how many of those people are duplicated. Um, the Pope and Young Club has about 7,000 members. That is a unbelievably, and to me, unacceptably small number. And and state organizations are struggling as well. And, and what people don't understand is, is organizations like the Pope and Young Club, we were founded uh, in 1961, because at that time, there were very few bow seasons. In, in many places that had, let's just say, deer seasons, for, for lack of talking about whitetail, many places that had whitetail seasons, uh, a bow wasn't recognized as a legal weapon. So you couldn't even hunt with a bow legally during the rifle season. So that's what organizations like Pope and Young were all about way back then. And the, the idea was to ensure the future of the sport. And that's still what we're all about. The, the problem we've had was our, our forefathers were so successful at opening up bow seasons in every state. We just had a groundswell of, of yeah, it's acceptable. Yeah, it's it's ethical. Jim, you were, you were mentioning about the, the millions of bow hunters there are in the country and how the the people who started uh, Pope and Young really impacted the uh, states uh, opening up archery seasons, yet uh, the membership isn't there. Why do you think that is? Uh, I think most of it is bow hunters are such a solitary sort. Uh, we just want to go hunt our deer and be left alone. That's, I think that's a lot of it. Some, some of it is that it's a problem with the Pope and Young Club is people don't realize that they can be a member. Another thing is they don't realize the benefits of being a member. And, and you know, it's all about communication both ways. Uh, but we have to get back into the history of, of why the Pope and Young Club started. You know, we started 50 years ago because there weren't both seasons for the most part in, in very many states. Even the, the states that had rifle deer seasons, bow wasn't considered a legal weapon. So the, the original reason to, to have a Pope and Young Club was to justify bow hunting, bow hunting only seasons in all 50 states. And, and they did a very good job. That's, that's where we ended up, how we ended up where we're at today is we have been very successful in getting states to recognize archery equipment as a viable tool. Um, it accounts for a whole lot of days in the field and, and gives the hunter a lot of recreation compared to rifle and, and muzzleloader. One of the problems we have today is we've been so successful at doing that People take it for granted now. Uh, we have bow seasons just about everywhere, bow only seasons, and and places like well, Alaska. Most places are any weapon, and the only reason is you don't have any competition. So if you want to bow hunt, you're not going to run into rifle hunters out in the field. So so it's not necessarily necessary there in a lot of places, but in the lower 48, it's very necessary that we have our own seasons. And now that we have gotten complacent. And state organization membership has gone down. We're complacent about our national representation. Uh, we're not working. We're not fighting. We're not giving. And now we're losing ground. And and at some point we have to wake up and decide where we're going to save this sport and make it as strong and viable and and as important as ever. Or we're just going to lose it. What we're going to end up with is pretty much any weapon during the season if, if we don't work at it. And we don't want that. Bow hunters never wanted to hunt with the rifle hunters. They didn't want to have to wear orange. We want to have camo. 
wander around, not worry about a rifle shot going off and just get out and hunt and have a good time. So I, I think that's the importance of belonging to an organization that can make a difference. Now, when you start out bow hunting, um, there's many, many manufacturers of clothing, of um, sites and releases. I mean, you can go the whole gamut. Has Pope and Young ever thought about um, working with those manufacturers um, of uh, gear and equipment uh, to have a Pope and Young membership just part of their purchase? That, that has been something that's been going on recently, I would say, probably in the last four years. We have what we call a corporate sponsor or corporate partner program, uh, and, and it allows manufacturers or, or not necessarily only manufacturers, but it, it allows entities to partner up with Pope and Young Club and uh, come up with ways to improve the sport. And and right now we have about 30 corporate partners that are, are working with us in one way or another um, to promote the club and promote the sport. And and that's that started before I became president. It's been a, a fairly successful program and it's it's growing as we speak because you know, finally, manufacturers are seeing the need for a national level of, of representation for bow hunters. And, and we have some great corporate sponsors that are doing a lot of good things for us right now. Thanks for that. I think back to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, which um, I was involved in. I'm a friend of the Elk Foundation. And one thing they did in each state, they lobbied i don't know how they did it but they have a uh license plate that you can get an rmm ef license plate has spoken ever thought about that idea you know we've, we've looked into things like that and and the, the the determining factor has always been we don't have enough members uh we, we just don't have the membership to support it and and most of those ideas like that takes a, a certain number of thousand members um, in any given state to make it happen. And at this point, we're not there yet. I would love to be to that point in, at some point, but we're still right now. We're a growing organization, and we have a ways to go. Just I'm going to segue. What's your vision next eighteen months? three years and five years for the Pope and Young Club? It's pretty simple. The vision is, is more members, uh, more awareness, more visibility, and and more acceptance among manufacturers and, and distributors, whatever. Um, it's, it's just more, more growth. And, and if you have more members, you have more clout when it comes decision-making time. Uh, if you have more partners, you have a little more money that you can work with. At some point, you can hire more staff to to do some of the you know government liaison work that you want to do. So the vision is growth. It's, it really comes down to one word, and that's growth from the top to the bottom. Thanks for that. And and folks, if you don't know how to get a hold of Pope and Young, it, it's really popeandyoungclub.org. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. And so, you know, spend some time. If you're an archer, whether you're 15 years old or, like myself, uh, 70 years old, if you hunt with a stick and a string, uh, you know, think about becoming a member because, uh, one, uh, they keep track of uh, your, you know, your Pope and Young um, buck. And, you know, some people like to count um, bone on, on, on top of heads of deer and other people hunt for the joy of it. But um, Pope Young is important. So from this guy's standpoint, um, you know, think about spending, what is it, $25, $30 a year, Jim? Uh, our membership now is $40 a year. It, it costs $35 to enter an animal in the record book. We do have some introductory offers where you can become a member for cheaper depending on, you know, various different things. And, and you can find that all out online or, or call a measure. Um, that's one thing to, to stress is most of our biggest advocates are our certified measures who actually see people and measure heads. And uh, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the record program if I could. Have at it. Because that's what, when people hear Pope and Young, they think the record book. And, and that's really what we are, what we were from the beginning is 
we needed to catalog the fact that bow hunters could actually be successful and could kill some big animals uh, to show the wildlife agencies that, yeah, these guys have an impact. Um, they can make a difference and, and, you know, we can record how many days of field it takes them to get an animal compared to a rifle hunter. And, and it's, you know, that's all about opportunity, but that's what the record book started out as was to catalog what we do, how successful we are. And, and of course, you know, on the upper end, we recognize the world records and we have our uh, awards program every two years. And that's, I can't discount that. That's a big deal. Have I being able to identify the, the biggest and the best and where they came from is fairly important. Um, but we still are a record keeping organization and we keep the statistics and, and we now have over a hundred thousand entries in our record books. And, and that's a, a huge asset for any of the game agencies, um, or, or any nonprofit that, that needs statistics and, and needs to understand what bow hunting is all about. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, it's really easy to go get a score sheet. Everything's uh, available for you. If you know you sh- you put Mister Wonderful down uh, in any uh, class of animal, just go and run your own score. Whether or not you put it in the book is up to you. But but it, it makes a nice um, uh, keepsake for you. Let's let's switch it up a little bit. I know that. Um, crossbows are are gaining momentum throughout the country and i just wonder what's the stance of pope and young in regards to crossbows uh, it, it's it's pretty simple and and it's been fairly consistent for a long time we we firmly believe that since we were the organization that opened up archery hunting uh, across the united states it's it's our belief pretty much to a man that uh Crossbows are different than handheld, hand-drawn bows, and shouldn't be in the same seasons. And and you know, as the president of the club, I, I understand the thinking about uh, handicap hunters and youth hunters and and all of this. But I'm really concerned about the effect that it has on our bow hunting opportunity. And and the, the biggest concern now is places where statistics are kept. Uh, we're finding out that the crossbow um, success rates are becoming higher than rifle success rates, and and greatly inflating the overall archery success rate. Which, as a bow hunter, is concerning. That how long is it going to be before the rifle hunters cut into our seasons? They'll say, okay, it's now we used to kill more animals and now we kill fewer, so we need more days, and the bow hunters need less days. To me, what it really comes down to is, is it handheld and hand-drawn? If, it, if it's not, I don't believe it should belong in the, the archery season. And, and that's pretty much the, been the stance of the Pope and Young Club since our beginning. We were hunters and gatherers when we began, and somebody figured out if they take a piece of willow and kind of shape it and then take some sinew and, and, and make a string and then get some flint and nap some arrowheads and then glue them onto a straight piece of wood, and they can go out and get dinner more efficiently. That's kind of the history. And, you know, I think we have to look at that and, um, you know, understand that process. Jim, your comments? Yeah, and, and with with me and with most of the Pope and Young members and, and most of the people that I hunt with, it really is about the hunt and not and not about the kill. And most of us took up bow hunting because it was harder. It, it was really that simple. The, the rifle hunts didn't last long enough. You'd go out and you might have a weekend hunt and you were done. And, and you're done because you're killing animals. And, and you could, you know, as a rifle hunter, you could still trophy hunt and hunt the whole hunt. But it's, it's just not the same as trying to get within 20 or 30 yards of, of a big game animal. Uh, you know, walking into his bedroom and, and whether you put up a stand or you sneak up on him, trying to fool that animal to get close enough to put an arrow in him, that's what it's all about. And, and that's what we have to keep reminding people that, that that's what the archery season should be. It should be about the hunt and about the challenge and not just about putting down a big animal the, the simplest way possible. 
You know, you remind me of a story about getting close as possible. A good friend of mine, Marv Clanky, from um, up in uh, Boulder, Colorado, tells a story. He was up uh, hunting stone sheep with our traditional bow, and um, he he they spotted one. He went all the way around, and they were watching him through optics and giving him hand signals. And all of a sudden, two hours, three hours into the stalk, they're holding up their hands like to stop. And he was right above this bedded stone sheep, and if he took one step just down, I'm going to say it's two feet, the sh- stone sheep were laying underneath that just a little um, drop, and he would have stepped right on it. And Marv told me, and I said, no way. He said, yeah, yeah, way. And it, it was just amazing how people who have been doing it for a long time uh, can get that close to animals because they're stealth, they're pure stealth. And it is about up close and personal in this guy's opinion. Yeah, and I agree 100%. Uh, getting close to an animal like that is just one of the most exciting things. And, and the joy of bow hunting, since you have to get close, you have to you have to make a lot of stocks before you're successful. And, and by doing a lot of stocks, uh, at some point you have those encounters where you almost step on something or you have a bear smell the end of your broad head or, you know, any number of things exciting can happen when you're trying to get that close. And, and once again, it, it, I think it's our job, uh, some of us old timers, to try to instill that joy and, and that pursuit in some of the younger hunters and and you know, make them realize that it is about the hunt and and not about just about the trophy. And I couldn't agree more on that. And while we're we're sitting there, you know, bow hunting is a passion of yours. And you mentioned, you know, you started off um, in Kansas. Let's talk about the hunting tradition in Jim's life. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I started hunting, um, you know, probably like most kids with a pellet gun. I think I probably shot a rabbit with a pellet gun before I, you know, before I really became a hunter. But, but my first memories of, of where I really felt like I was a hunter was I was able to buy a single shot, 20 gauge shotgun when I was nine years old. And, uh, uh Took it out, you know, did some practice with, with clay pigeons and whatnot. But my first pheasant hunt, I actually killed two pheasants with two shots in one weekend. So so that's how I started hunting. So I started out as a, a bird hunter. And uh, growing up in Kansas in the early 70s, you couldn't even get a deer license until you were 16. So, so that was out of the question. So I started out as a, a shotgunner, a trapper, and a uh, now and then varmint hunter. Um, you know, my, my dad was a, a pretty hardcore bird hunter and somewhat of a rifleman. But, you know, even as a landowner, he couldn't get a deer tag every year. In fact, he only had two kansas deer tags throughout the whole decade of the 70s that's how hard the tags were to get back then the way i became a bow hunter was i drew a a rifle deer tag when i turned 16 the first year i was eligible and uh i you know i was in high school i hunted about six days of a nine-day hunt saw 22 does and never saw a buck and so that was my first deer hunt the reason I became a bow hunter was you couldn't even apply for a rifle tag the year after you had a tag. You had to go a year without, but you get a bow tag every year. So the next year I wanted to hunt deer. I, I bought an old used Polar LTD bear six wheel compound and, you know, applied for the archery tag and son of a gun. Now I'm a bow hunter and uh, I've been bow hunting. I've hunted whitetails every year since then. Uh, hunted elk most years, you know, bear, pronghorn, a lot of years. I just, ever since then, I try to hunt as much as I can. In the warm up, you were telling me about your gear. So, could you share what uh, your setup is today? I've been shooting uh, a similar version of the same bow since 1983. Uh, it, it, in the early 80s, I bought a, a big horn 
uh, one piece bighorn recurve, 60 inch recurve, about 65 pounds. And a few years later, they came out with a takedown. And, and except for two years since 1983, I've shot a, a bighorn recurve. And I've, I've actually been shooting the same bow since 1999. And, and I have a few pairs of spare limbs and a few spare handles, but they're all basically the same bow. And, uh, so I shoot that bow, either a 52 pound or 58 pound is what I'm shooting now, depending on how big animals I'm going after. And I make my own cedar arrows. I shoot a either a Magnus two blade glue on head or an old bear razor head, and uh, that, that's that's what I hunt with. And one year I hunted with a Robertson takedown, and one year I hunted with a bighorn longbow, but. I've since uh, what about ninety five. I've been shooting a, a bighorn takedown recurve pretty much every year since. Now, shooting a traditional bow, how much do you practice every day or every month? Well, I practice every day if I can, but you know that that doesn't work. You can't do it every day, but I practice a lot. I, I don't shoot a lot of arrows because I've had some some shoulder and some neck issues, but. But most days, especially from, say, the 1st of March on, you know, I'll go out and I'll shoot 15 arrows. And, and there, you know, I'll miss a few days, and then some days I'll go out in the morning, and some days I'll go out in the evening. So I actually shoot a lot, if you add all of that up. Um, I just don't shoot a lot of repetition. And as a traditional bow hunter, I, I came to realize a long time ago that it takes years to get profession. And, and even though I could do okay at the range and, and shoot okay with, with guys at the, shooting 3D targets, when it came time to shoot the animal, um, it just took years of repetition before I, I actually got good enough where I had a lot of confidence that I was going to kill something all the time. And now after, what, 30 years of doing it, I've finally got to where I'm pretty successful. Do you use any pins at all, or is it all instinctive? It's all instinctive, and and I've I can shoot out forty yards fairly accurately. I have five acres here at my house, and and I have five or six three D targets set up, and and my elk target is forty yards from the cottonwood tree where I usually stand in the shade and shoot. So I I shoot fifteen to forty yards just about every day, and uh, given ideal situations i i can shoot out to 40 now i haven't done it very often but it it can be done so listeners take some heart because jim really knows you know what it takes to be a great instinctive shooter even if you have a release even if you have um you know four pins optic sights whatever you're using on your compound um it doesn't matter how much you spend for that equipment it's how much practice you put into it because uh, from this man's point of view you owe the most ethical shot you can uh, to the animal you're hunting or don't hunt that's pretty much where i'm at with that because if you don't practice then your your success ratio goes down 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 and i'm not even talking about practicing a month before the season as soon as the snow goes as soon as it warms up you got to be out there in your backyard and just releasing arrows, even if you only can shoot 20 yards, stack them. Yeah. Your thoughts, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. And being in my position, I meet a lot of bow hunters, uh, all the way from the beginners to the, uh, the 70 year old guys, 80 year old guys. And it, it never ceases to amaze me that even if a guy can go to a, uh, a 3d shoot and shoot pretty good and, and, you know, gives the impression that he's a pretty good shot. If he's not practicing, you know, at least four or five months out of the year, when the moment of truth comes, those are the guys that blow the shot. Even though they could walk out their door and hit the target every time at 30, 40 yards, just the fact that they didn't have that repetition and that ingrained instinct, something went wrong. They picked the wrong pin. You know, they were shooting downhill. Um punch the release too soon, who knows what, but it's always the guys that don't practice that have the most trouble killing, killing trophy animals. 
And thanks for that. And listeners, I just want to uh, read something that uh, Jim uh, it wrote. We want to encourage the original spirit of bow hunting that by limiting yourself to a bow and arrow, you have to get close to the animal, make better, more effective shots, and grow as a hunter. So, Jim, taking your words and your history and everything, how has that grown you? No, um, how has that grown you as a hunter, as a man, and as a husband? Well, as, as a hunter, um, it, it's just the years of experience. You you try to get close to animals, and the more you're closer to animals, you. you learn how they're going to react under certain situations and you learn what you can get away with. And, you know, sometimes you have to be aggressive and sometimes you go slow. So as a hunter, it's, you know, I feel like I'm a, I'm in my prime right now because I have experienced so much and I still have the physical ability to, to get to the animals and get it done. So my experience helps me get close and, and, my age helps me get the shot more than anything. Now, uh, with my family, I, you know, how does that how does that apply? My my daughter's a hunter. Uh, she tried bow hunting a little bit, and you know, through high school, you know how kids are that she just didn't have time and college and all of that. So recently, she's been a rifle hunter, and and we have some great fun hunts, and and she's really successful. Um, because, you know, I learn where to go and, and learn where the animals are and she gets a tag in those areas and we go out and find something good and she's an expert shot and she, she's successful. Um, what was the third? The third thing? As a husband. Oh, as a husband. Um, that might be a little tougher. My, you know, my wife has a ton of patience. She apparently has more patience than I do because she puts up with me. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, she must have figured out that I was a pretty good guy and, and she could put up with me and my bad habit, which is going out and trying to sneak up on deer, bear and elk every year. Um, but it's, it's taught me patience with everybody around me. And, and the, the bottom line with any relationship is patience and love and respect. And if you have that, you have everything. You know, one thing in the warm up, you, you, you spoke about um, your relationship with God and the outdoors and how that's really impacted you and helped mature you. You want to speak about that for a couple minutes? Yeah, well, I, I have a, uh, well, like you said, I have a very strong faith in God. I feel like I'm extremely close with God all the time, but even closer when you're out in the woods, um, just because you're in God's creation. You're not in, in a house, which is theoretically man's creation. You are out there where, where God lives. So it, it brings me closer, and, and I spend a lot of time thinking about that. And, and the more you think about it, the, the stronger your faith becomes, and the, the more you rely on that faith to guide you. Thanks for sharing that. Jim, we're at the time in the show that uh, you get a chance to give some shout outs to people that are supporting you, friends, or that have helped you along the way. So why don't you take a couple minutes and uh, have at it? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to start with our uh, the Pope and Young Club's corporate partners. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to shout out the, the list of those names because they, they have stepped up to help the club to ensure the future of bow hunting. And, and they've all done it in different ways. Um, but, you know, just start to finish. We, we have a corporate partner to begin with is KUYU, um, the ultralight hunting equipment. Cabela's, of course, Sitka Gear. Um, Nocturnal has, has become a recent partner. Muzzy Broadheads, True Fire, and Rage Broadheads. Uh, Wild Television Network is a sponsor. Bear Archery is a sponsor. Um, Outdoor Edge has given us a, a bunch of knives for a uh, membership drive that's turned out to be really great for us. Uh, Hunt Channel. Um, ASA, um, through their their archery program, they're helping us out a lot. Wilderness Athlete. Scent Crusher is one of the new sponsors. Uh, Yeti. You used to say Yeti coolers, but now I think it's more like Yeti products. They're a sponsor. Ripcord Arrow Rest, uh, Luminoc, Hoyt, 
uh, a long time sponsor even before I, we had our program was bow hunting safari consultants they've helped us with our auctions and hunts and raffles and whatnot zeiss optics been a great sponsor tacticam uh, which is a, a bow mounted camera bow hunting world Three Rivers Archery, the traditional guys that sell a lot of traditional equipment, Matthews Bows, HHA Sports, Lancaster Archery Supply, the Sportsman's Guide was one of our first big sponsors, Goat Tough Products, um, they make arrow equipment, Candle Lake Outfitters is, is one of our uh, outfitters that's a sponsor, and and. There might be a few new ones that I'm not aware of yet, but that's that's pretty much the bulk of them. Well, thank you for giving those guys a shout out, and and thank you for uh, everybody that Jim mentioned for being uh, corporate sponsors because uh, it's an uphill it's an uphill battle for Pope and Young to get people to recognize that. Um, the iconic brand, quote unquote, of uh, archery and the person or the entity that's carried it forward is the Pope and Young Club. So, if if you are an archer, there's no reason that you're not a member, even if you're never going to put uh, a, a book uh, game animal in, uh, you still should belong. And um, Jim, thank you so much for being on the show uh, at Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast today. Bruce, thank you a lot. Um, it, thanks for the opportunity to to get out and sell the club and my passion. As your host at Whitetail Rendezvous, I want to thank each and every one of you for spending your time with us today. I look forward to sharing with you in the next episode more whitetail hunting tips, techniques, and stories. Until then, keep the sun at your back, the wind in your face, and always be patient. <laughs> If you have any tips, comments, or suggestions, or what we can do to improve, because we're here to serve you, let us know. Thanks for listening to Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast at www.whitetailrendezvous.com.